All right. Well, welcome to Founders Unscripted. Glad to have you on the show. And today Thanks we have me. on the show, absolutely, we have Ola Midi um, Afolabi from Nigeria, Africa, and he is part of Y Combinator Winter 22. So a fellow alumni, I come from Winter 20, Winter 18, so mm -hmm. we're four years apart. And um, super excited to have you on the show. And let's kick things off, um, Ola Midi. Give me just an introduction on who you are, your background, and what got you into uh, tech startups. Oh, okay. Thank you for having me, TK. Um, so basically, um, I've been very fascinated with technology since I was um, in my cradle stage. Um, so I really wanted to know what makes you know, things work. Uh, and the fact that somebody can sit behind a desk and change the world was one of the things that you know, become very interesting to me. But... So when we were in the university, we had this Microsoft Imagine Cup, so that looks like the World Cup of Software, where uh, Microsoft encouraged students to take one of the Millennium Development Goals by United Nations and use technology to solve it. Um, so myself and my friends, we were always, you know, practicing, you know, working on one solution or the other from the MDG Goals. Um, one of such solutions was what made us win Microsoft Imagine Cup in 2013. And we represented Nigeria in Russia, <laughs> actually. Um, so we built a solution that helped people living with cardiovascular diseases and people that you know, are trying to get rehabilitated from stroke. But um, when we got to Russia, we saw high-class solutions that you know, were very far better than <laughs> what we have built. Um, but one of the things that we learned from there is that um, entrepreneurship is different from being a geek. You need to really know how to sell your solution and you need to know how to um, get customers. And from there, there was no looking back. I knew I was never going to get employed by anybody. So I just you know, started digging in, into what it takes to become an entrepreneur. So I studied mechanical engineering from the university. Um, but from my first year to my last year, I've been writing code. I used to code in C Sharp, Python, C++ anything that can, I can use to talk to the computer. I see. And are you, so I saw you're the co-founder and CEO. How many uh, founders are there? Two, uh, Michael and Kabiru. Uh, Michael is in charge of growth. Kabiru is in charge of operations. I see. Awesome. And um, tell me what sparked the original idea. So uh, what I got is you guys were in Russia. Was it like a, like a competition sponsored by Microsoft, you said? And how yes. long was that ago? So that was um, 2013, no, far, far long ago. Um, but um, after mm. that, we've tried our hands on a couple of startups. Uh, myself and Michael, mm -hmm. with one of our other friends, um, uh, we, we built um, a solution for, for hospitals, for people that uh, to help doctors schedule appointments. And, you know, in Africa, mm. it used to be that when you get to the hospital, you, your doctor can just cancel on you and people get stranded there. So we built a solution that allowed the doctor to cancel or confirm an appointment a while before. And that was going great, but our model was, was wrong. We were running it with our money. So we ran the product, so we ran out of money. <laughs> then um, we started a, pro a, a company called Sonwo, uh, which was actually to help people with microtransactions. Um, we learned a lot from mm. that journey before we then turned into Touch and Pay and built a product called Cowrie that now have over 3 million customers. How many customers? 3 million. 3 million customers. Woo! Yeah. That, is, that is exciting. So you guys, wow. Let's, let's talk about this um, ideation of Cowrie. So um, did you come up with this idea prior to getting into YC? Let's kind of walk me through the journey of uh, getting accepted into YC now. Like when, when was that idea? Was it Cowrie that was the idea? When did you decide, hey, this is it. We're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and apply to YC. And was it your first or your second attempt? Walk us through yeah. that journey. Okay, so we applied for YC first in 2017. Um, and with, with our company, of course, Touch and Pay, we did not have the product called Cowrie then. Um, we were focused on um, providing revenue assurance for the informal sector. Um, so we applied for YC. We got invited into 
um, the YC at Sunnyvale. And <laughs> during the interview, maybe we goofed, <laughs> I don't know, but we got rejected. Um, we, we, we were not depressed. <laughs> so we came back and we got fired up, started looking for product market fit for our solution. Um, so what we, what we did was that we did something very crazy. When um, the government was looking for uh, um, solution for bus transport, we provided our solution without even signing a contract. And that was one of the crazy things that we did. The, the clients, which was a government parastatal, then introduced us to another government parastatal like, called Light Ferry. So they, they were focused on um, um, operating the ferries in Lagos State. So we also provided revenue assurance mm -hmm. for them. So when COVID struck, and every year, you know, YC will always message you, oh, we saw that you applied last year, you didn't enter. Many founders have tried more than once, try again. So we kept trying, sure. right? Yeah. And we kept getting rejection letter 2017, 2018. But we just kept keep uh, building our product, keep looking for product market fit. So when the COVID struck and the government wanted to reopen the economy, um, we saw that as an opportunity. So we went to them and said that, hey, we can provide something like the Hoister card in the UK or the Metro card in New York for the government. And they said, oh, what's your track record? So we've been working for uh, Lagos Bus Services Limited, which is like a government ham, and we've been working with um, Lack Ferry as well for the ferry. And then we show some of the traction that we've done. So they said, okay, go ahead and do a pilot. So we ran a pilot with like 10,000 cards. Uh, but every year we keep applying for YC, pushing, updating our attraction and all that. Then um, all of a sudden, we got 100,000 customers um, after running the pilot. Then we got 200,000. We eat a million customers. Then Michael just called us, Michael Seibel, and said, I saw yeah. this traction and it's, it's crazy. Uh, we said, oh, we are sorry. This year we did not bother to, we are not applying this year anymore. We already got in interest with some investors, um, TLCOM and some other investors. Uh, we are just, we've just signed a term sheet of $4 million and all that. And Michael said, no, get off the term sheet and get into YC. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was exactly what, uh, what happened. Um, we, we got into YC. Uh, Michael called us twice that day <laughs> and he convinced us to, to get into YC. <laughs> And since then, no going back. <laughs> That's right. Look, I mean, we got persistence up here. Persistence is the game. Look, Olam Midi just just said he's got rejected, rejected after another, and just it's about persistence, right? Never yeah. giving up. And you guys found this product market fit. Um, just for the audience, you know, that are kind of foreign, you know, you're doing this microprocessing, and it seems like Harry offers an online, offline and also an online. Um, I'm on your website and I'm seeing like we are the powering, we are powering financial inclusion with the use of NF, NFC to capture both online and offline transactions. Yeah. Uh, explain the use case of what is NFC, first of all, and what is kind of unique um, with the Cowrie, uh solution? Oh, okay, so um, what we realized in Africa is that why we have a lot of players digitizing and processing transactions that are big, uh, I mean the likes of $100, $200, $500 type of transactions. Um, in Africa, most of the micro transactions, I mean $0.10 cents to $10 type of transactions, are still mostly cash-based. And this is not just in Nigeria. And you see these transactions in places like transportation, in places like people buying, um, trying to buy snacks while waiting for bus, in places like um, utility payments generally. And we thought to ourselves that we need to fix this problem. Um, and the NFC technology is near field communication, is like the Hoister card in the UK. It's like the Metro card, contactless technology basically. Um, so we built mm. that because we use that technology because we needed something that would make cash. So when we say offline, it means that whenever there is downtime in network, our payment system must still work. Because when we start asking our, our customers questions, we realize that the reason why a lot of bank-led transactions have not caught on was because of the reliability. For microtransactions, when people try to pay and they, don't, they are stranded because of network glitch, 
they are discouraged. So they quickly revert back to cash. So we thought to ourselves that what technology can be as reliable as cash and can be so simple to use. And we found our answer in the contactless technology. So we build a closed loop card technology um, that looks like this, Kauri. And um, people just buy the card. We get, they get onboarded and they load their phones on this card. And instead of paying cash, they can just tap the card to pay. So we found a very interesting use case with transportation. So currently we help over 400,000 people pay for bus rides daily in, in Africa. And that number is growing. Um, so we, we, we believe that before the end of the year, we should be able to get to 10 million users and get about 2.5 million active people paying with our payment infrastructure. Mm. And um, so 3 million users are using, in terms of just like product market fit, you've got that, nailed it. But in terms of like how you guys monetize, um, how much money do you guys make based on those 3 million users? We make about $350,000 um, monthly. So we take 3% on every transaction that we process. Mm. Oh, every transaction you take 3%? Yes. These are microtransactions, nice. by the way. That's like 10 cents kind of transaction to $10. Small value. What, what was the bus um, and the transportation systems, what, what, what were they using prior to this technology? They were using cash. <laughs> and they were losing 40% of their revenue to, <laughs> to theft. Wow. I'm, I'm amazed that there's these areas around the world that still could use this cool technology to like bring them into the, you know, the modern century, of course. Um, that's fascinating that no one tried to do this prior to um, touch and pay. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? Was it lucky? I mean, how, how do you look at that? Yeah, well, I think it's um, preparation meeting opportunity. Um, one of the things that gave us or that brought about our opportunity was COVID. Um, so the regulated transport scheme for the states, uh, Lagos State, for example, um, needed to have contact tracing. They needed to be able to say, oh, in case of an outbreak and, we, and um, people have entered a bus, we need to be able to trace all the customers on this bus. And that was what opened the opportunity for us. So we were already doing revenue assurance for like two operators. So we've gathered experience. So, and then um, um, there's also wow. favor, 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 uh, favoritism for local built companies. So we were like the only local company that have done anything within that space. And, and that was why we were, you know, we were favored. <laughs> wow. And, um, just so I have a recap, can you remind remind me how you came up with the opportunity, how you saw the opportunity during COVID? Yeah. So basically, what, what has happened was that we were pr uh, processing payments or providing revenue assurance for um, one of the parastatals of the government. And mm. when COVID struck, one of the biggest challenges of opening back the economy was contact tracing in the sense that um, if there are 50 people in a bus and one of them has been diagnosed of COVID, they want to be able mm -hmm. to get the contact of everybody on that trip so that they can isolate them or anybody that have been in contact with the person. And there was no way to do yeah. that because payments were still done through cash and you don't have the identity of yeah. anybody on the bus. So uh, yeah. we said we can provide that. So everybody that have the carry card, they are registered. They, we, get their, we have their phone number, we have their first, first and last name, we have their gender, we have their date of birth. So we gather those kind of information and we save it. So every time people tap on a bus, we are able to say, oh, yep. these are the people that are on this bus. And that was the opportunity that we latched on. Amazing. And then prior to that, you were doing already transactions with the, with the government agency? Yeah. For what kind of payments? Yeah. So we were helping, we were helping were trans um, transport payments, actually, transport payments. Oh, got it. Got it. Um, in, in a different use case? Yes, yes. So that was just one operator. However, there were about 40 bus operators that the government was supposed to be working with. Um, so we were working with just one operator and another operator for the waterways. Um, so when this opportunity came, then all the other operators yep. were compelled 
to use our payment technology. Wow. <laughs> what an amazing opportunity. And you struck while the iron was hot. So congrats on that. Yeah. Talk to me about your Thank first you. investment. Was Weiss your first investment coming in? I think they raised the investment um, as well. It's You get 500K, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. with this latest batch. Yeah. Okay. So Weiss was, was not our first investment. investment. No. So we had um, two investors prior to YC. We had um, Lofty Inc. and hmm. Afropreneur. We also had um, Unicorn Growth. Um, I think we also have um, Fronezi. We have another investor um, before we then did YC. But um, what happened was we got this investment um, with, this, with SAFE, with SAFE Agreement, which, was, which made it easy for us to extend hmm. um, to, into YC. So those were like the um, major I investments that we got before YC. Uh, how much was your total investment you raised before YC? Um, I think a little below a million, a million dollars. A little below. Yeah, a little below a million nice. dollars. What yeah. was your first? Who was your first check? Um, that that would be Lofty Inc. Afropreneur. We raised five hundred thousand dollars from them. Wow, is it an angel group or what's their kind of background? Yeah, I think I think they are VC, um, but I mean VC. they have this. Uh, yeah, they are VC firm in Africa. They've invested in Andela. They invested in Florida Wave early stage, um, so <laughs> so they invested in us as well. Yeah, I'm familiar with Andela. Um, since I'm in the edtech space with our NGT Academy, um, I remember them doing some awesome work over there. Um, yeah. Now I'm curious with that. First 500K, what was the terms, if you don't mind sharing? What kind of valuation was that at? <laughs> so our initial valuation before YC was, I think, um, 11 post money. 11. Um, wow. then, after, yeah. <laughs> then after YC, we jumped to like, the minimum we did after YC was 35. Then the maximum we did was 50. Mm, wow, million. 35 to yeah. 50. Yeah. All on safe notes, or did you guys do a price round? All on safe. <laughs> our Series A will be our All first safe. price yeah. round. Yeah. Wow. So on the post-money valuation, or, I mean, the first, I, I consider it maybe the pre-seed, your first million coming in yeah. prior to YC. Um, did you have the 3 million customers already when that 500K check came in, or was this uh, before? Oh, it was before. It was before. Um, after our investment, we were growing at twenty-eight percent month on month. Um, yeah, it was before. Nice. Um, so the early investors that put in the million was the concept still the same? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so basically, um, our concept has always been that we partner with um, um, a policymaker. Um, to acquire a lot of customers, mm. and they, at the end of the day, we are able to serve those customers all their value. Uh, so it has always been what we see work for our kind of business, because um, the problem yeah. with payment is that uh, people want to be digitized or included at the point of their need, and that's one of the things that we found interesting. So, um, so we always latch on on that, provide value at the point of people's need, and then scale from there. Nice. And um, so post YC, how much did you end up raising? A few more million? Yeah, I didn't know. We ended up raising 3.2 in total. And then uh, we are profitable. Uh, yeah, we make about we make about 350K monthly. And our bond rate is about nice. 180. Wow. So... Are you guys looking to raise an A round or are you looking to just scale right now? So um, one of the things that we see with our business is that we tend to invest a lot on infrastructure because the infrastructure that we are building or that our solution needed to thrive on doesn't exist today. The infrastructure for microtransaction. Um, so we're just creating it. So um, sometimes when we need to scale, we need to invest a lot of money up front. 
And that's the only reason why we are trying to raise uh, $10 million for our Series A, um, so that we'll be able to dominate the market in Africa. Um, we've gone for scoping mission in other African countries like Ghana, Sierra Leone, Senegal, Kenya, and the likes. And we see that there's a huge opportunity there for us to scale into. Um, however, um, for this to make sense, we will need you know, a lot of talents. We will need um, a lot of infrastructure so that um, we'll be able to easily dominate those markets. And that's the reason why we are, we are raising. Wow. Well, congratulations. Um... Uh, Ola Midi, because, you know, most founders struggle to even get to profitability and you've just been crushing it. You know, those four years, just, you know, being persistent on your grind, never giving up, like kudos to you. I mean, that's that's amazing. And where you're at in terms of position in the market, this B2B, 350K, like MRR, like you are crushing it, my friend. So if there's any like key tips, um. How are you able to find success? What are some key kind of like pivotal moments that you could share with the audience that you thought could be beneficial for aspiring founders? Yeah, um, there was something that YC always, you know, teach us. Uh, thank God you're an alumni that you need to focus on your customers. The most important people are not investors. They are not, uh, they are not your co-founders. The most important people for your business to grow are your customers. And as long as you are meeting your customers' need, um, that's like the best investment you can get. That's like the best money you can get. <laughs> so what we did was we listened to our customers and tailored the solution to our customers. And I think that that's the, one of the key things that has made us successful. Um, every single time um, we try to deviate from there, we always miss it. Uh, and I think that the same is true for founders everywhere in the world. Uh, this is not about startup Fugazi, you know, being a poster boy or being um, on, the, on the front of Forbes magazine. What is most important is creating value for the customers and um, making sure that you are able to capture those values and sell it to them in a way that is so simple and, uh, and it's easy for them. And that has been our DNA. That has been everything we live by. Every other thing is not important. Wow, I, I love it. There's a lot of golden nuggets here, guys, listening. Um, um, one is the customer feedback loop. I, I hear this over and over again, but you know, sometimes as founders, like you said, we we focus on the wrong things. Like, like it's about me versus the customers. And that's where we get it wrong as founders. It's not what we want. It's what what's best for the customer. And I like how you kind of summarize that is that one, make sure that you're listening to the customer and then have that feedback loop into your team, into yeah. your product, and make sure that your product is simple, is what I heard, easy to use and provides yeah. a ton of value, right? So, wow, yeah. amazing for those takeaways. Um, and so, um, you guys are three co-founders. Are you guys uh, split evenly, one third each, or how does the equity distribute it? Yeah, well, technically, one third each. But um, in a, in uh, I have a bit higher, um, uh, so not exactly one third each, uh, because I'm I'm the CEO. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a bit higher than than the rest. <laughs> but uh, I, yeah, you are about right with one third each, with just a bit higher from by me. <laughs> Got it. So you do you, as CEO, do you own majority of the company? Yes. And then you brought on two other co-founders, so they have a little bit less equity, I'm assuming? Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, fair enough. You know, like um it just depends, right? Who founded the company, who's the CEO? Sometimes those ratios uh will will play differently. Um, according to your know, timeline and, and kind of the roles. So um, just just another advice for all founders listening to this interview is that there is no right way of kind of cutting up equity. But I always like to kind of ask, you know, how you guys came up with dividing your equity. Any yeah, other comments um, there? Um, any so, comments there? Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, um, it's sometimes it's, Arts is an art, and sometimes it's science. Um, for me, it depends on value. Um, and, you know, equity doesn't really count until probably 
there's an acquisition or there's an IPO. It's it's really just something to give people comfort and all that. And you see, sometimes a priority change in a business and some people leave, some people, you know, so the company grow faster than some people and all that. So the most important thing is um, who is adding value more, who is ab able to uh, stick their neck out and ensure that, you know, this is done. And then you can just um, kind of split the equity based on that. And sometimes uh, you just get emotional about it and just say, oh, this person added a lot of value at the early stage that brought us to this point. So for me, it's not so important as much as um, making sure that the company grow to a, a stage that is important. Um, but, I mean, fighting over equity at any stage or splitting equity um, in one way or the other, for me, is not so much as important. But, um, as, mo but as much as growing the business, focusing on growth, focusing on uh, making sure that you acquire a lot of customers and ensuring that things... I, I believe that if, if you have cordial relationship with your founders, you can always... Um, realign in the, in, in the middle uh, um, um, based on priorities and based on all that. What the investors have advised people to do is do reverse vesting so that if one um, founder decides to leave, it doesn't, the person doesn't go away with all the shares. Uh, as long as that is there, uh, whatever way you decide to split your equity with your early founders doesn't really count. Um, and, and as long as somebody is not feeling cheated. Nice answer. Um... Now, transitioning into kind of uh, your background, I saw that you, you mentioned that you done kind of web design and coding in high school. Are, are you the full stack developer on your team or do you have another uh, developer? Yeah, so we have a CTO now. I used to be uh, a techie, a geek, you know, focusing on writing codes, backend and all that. Um, but with the day-to-day -day running of the business, <laughs> I had to, I couldn't keep up. So uh, we have a CTO that, you know, that managed the tech team. So what I do mostly now is um, architect the product together with the tech team and then um, figure out a way to make sure that it's simple to the customers, manage stakeholders, and mm -hmm. also manage our investors. Uh, that's like my day-to-day -day runnings now. And I also do a lot of business development. Um, I look for clients um, that can potentially use our system and also ensure that all the stakeholders are happy. Um, but we have a very capable team that really focuses on the tech now. But I used to be, I started off being a coder. I built some of the first, yeah. uh, one of the major libraries, one of the you know major code base that you know, our solution kind of ride on now. But I'm sure our tech team must have overhauled most of my code <laughs> because right now I think that they are far better than me. That's amazing. I mean, this is another story, right? Where you can literally go from a CTO or be that first person to write the code for the MVP, but transition. Um, it seems like you had a very smooth transition. Not everyone can make that transition. Like what I recommend is like, if you can be extroverted, you can be uh, customer facing and you, you are good at presenting and sales, then definitely the founder can transition into the CEO or stay as a CTO and hire a CEO. In this case, yeah. Olamidi decided to step up to CEO and really, uh, you know, create space for the new CTO to come on board and um, run things. So amazing transition there. Now, for those that, I mean, your story is so fascinating too, because you know, I'm a first generation Korean American that came to the states and 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 I ended up in Silicon Valley uh, through YC. But like. Um, it's fascinating to see, you know, uh, people from all around the world, aspiring entrepreneurs, founders to come um, to Silicon Valley and, and start businesses. In your case, you know, what what inspired you in, in the startup world? And also, um, if you don't mind me asking, how old are you right now? Now I'm 32. <laughs> 32. Got it. And so prior to this startup, were you... A developer in the corporate world in Nigeria? Were you doing some corporate stuff? Yeah. So uh, I started off as being the CTO of a gaming company called Game Soul. Um, so and this was when I was in year four at the university. Uh, so I traveled with my uh, with my then CEO um, Abiola Lanira to Kenya. <laughs> he got he got investment. Um, from 88 MPH. That was like um, an accelerator program in Kenya. Um, so we went there, we mm. built we built a gaming company together. Uh, so, but when I got back to the Wait, university... how old were you? 
I was so young. I was probably 17 or 18 then. Then I was probably 18 years wow. old <laughs> when I did Game Soap with Babiola. Uh, so, so I learned a lot. I, I've actually never worked in the corporate world. Uh, I started off straight um, with an entrepreneurial mindset. So I learned a lot from, um, from that experience with Game Soap on what it takes to, to have a startup spirit. Um, so you are very mm-hmm. nimble, you are very small, but you have to be the one to do everything. Um, so, and um, because we yeah. were incubated, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of startup founders. And I was at all the meetings, you know, seeing what it takes to really build um, inst- interesting startups. Um, Mudundu, a music streaming company that has now high PO'd, was part of our batch then. And so I witnessed their growth, was wow. able to see everything. Wow, such a fascinating story. You know, I recommend to all founders, if you are like even remotely thinking about getting into the tech startup space, is join an incubator, join, um, you know, a weekend um, competition, uh, hackathon, join the startup group, meetups, events, like just get plugged into the startup community. But I love incubators and accelerators because I think like if you can experience one of those, I've been through three incubators, it really fast tracks you into this world of startups, right? And you learn so much from it. So I highly recommend it for all founders. If someone's listening here in Africa and thinking like, man, like I'm, I'm not talented as Ola, Ola media. I I don't, I I don't know anything about coding, but I know technology is the future. And, and this interview is inspiring me to become a tech founder one day. What, what would be some advice for them? Yeah. So, so basically I, I always say that, um, Everybody tries with tech. Um, so, so, for example, irrespective of the business that you do, um, if you are able to scale it with tech, there is no stopping you. Um, I've witnessed um, health management organization grow to an unstoppable amount in Africa just because they, they added tech. I've witnessed manufacturing company grow immensely. Um, insurance company mm. grow just because they added tech. So so basically, um, anybody that is building anything, be it agri-tech, edu-tech, health-tech, they really need to start thinking of how they can scale with technology. Um, even if it is manufacturing, the major way to scale is through tech. And if you are not adding tech to your business, um, it's probably going to end up just that business is never going to be a startup. And I say startup is a growing machine. It's a growth machine. You need to, it's an exponential math, mathematics. It's not linear. You need to, you know, jump from 200 customers to 20,000 customers. And the only way that is humanly possible is when you can scale with tech. So I encourage anybody starting up to always figure out a way to leverage technology to scale their business, to win their competition. Now, if, if someone's listening in Africa or any other uh, country where it's there's less kind of uh, tech available to them, what would you recommend? Someone in Africa that um, is completely foreign to this and heard this interview, how would they get started in tech? How, what would you recommend? So, I mean, all we needed was a laptop and internet. Everything you need to survive to succeed in this world is on the internet. He's on YouTube, he's on Udemy, he was on... And the, the reality is that almost everything is free. All you need is just be committed. LinkedIn is free. Uh, we found some of our most valuable staff on LinkedIn. Um, um, the knowledge, there are so many boot camps that you found online, and some of them are even free, that you can join and, you know, learn a lot about tech. Uh, so... Irrespective of where you are in Africa, even though, you know, you have power problem like we have in Nigeria, you have, I mean, all those things, there are no longer excuses. We've seen people in the most remote part of Africa um, with a laptop succeeding. So um, all you need to do is just the willingness and, you know, the, the resilience um, that it takes that despite your limitations, um, you won't give up. And I'm sure that we're going to strike gold if you keep eating the rock. Nice. I love it. You know, 
laptop, internet connection, guys. That's all you need. You you heard it himself, right? Like you can be anywhere in the world. And I too, I too agree. There's so much free information online. You have no excuse. Like, oh, I, I don't have the money for this coding bootcamp. No, like there's free coding bootcamps online, yeah. right? And so yeah. there is no excuse. As long as you have a dream and a vision and what I consider like passion and belief in yourself, then as long as you don't give up, you can make that manif that dream manifest into reality. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, um, it was a pleasure having this interview. Uh, love hearing your st story. Um, I know it's going to inspire um, thousands, if not millions of people, hopefully, uh, that listen to this podcast here in the future. But um, any last words, uh, Olamidi? Uh, for our audience uh, that you would like to share before we uh, close up this um, interview. Anything off yeah. script, anything that you think that can be beneficial that maybe I didn't ask that you would like to pass on to our listeners? Yeah, so one of the, in my journey as an entrepreneur, one of the things that I found very fascinating is the fact that um, when you're trying to solve a problem, the most important thing is understanding your customers. And when you understand them and you tailor the solution to them and you get them to a point where they can recommend your product to somebody else, it can be very hard. It can take you three years to get to that point. It can take you two or three mm. pivots, pivots to get to that point. But once you are able to get to that point, there is really no stopping you. And a lot of impossible startups have emerged. Um, I mean, when I was in the university and I heard about Airbnb, I thought that was a crazy idea. That shouldn't be a startup that will succeed. It, maybe it can succeed in, in, in the West, but not in Africa, where there's so much insecurity. But we have a lot of people that have become millionaires with Airbnb in Africa. And that should show that anything with resilience, and resourcefulness and tenacity, anything can succeed. Uh, you just need to make sure that you keep at it and you don't waver, you don't give up. And, and, and I think that anything can succeed. Wow, I love it. And um, I love the fact that we're telling the audience that it's, it's all about the customers and, and really focusing on the solution that can be customized that's where the innovation, I believe, and room for disruptive technologies or solutions to come in and into a market where you can get your lion's share of the market by introducing a new solution that elegantly solves the customer's problem. And, and it, it may take three pivots is what I'm hearing, right? It may take yeah. three years, but to not give up and to have that tenacity to just keep believing in the product and just iterating until you find a solution that is scalable. But another thing that um, Olamidi mentioned was the word of mouth. I think that is very yeah. powerful. You nailed it on the head with that. If your customer can start uh, creating a, a word of mouth, that means you know you have a stellar product because your your exactly. customers are willing to share that with other people. So thank you, Olamidi. This was an amazing interview. Thank you for all the wisdom and knowledge you've shared, the inspiration. Um, Thanks you know, you just kind of lit a fire. I'm excited about uh, watching your journey unfold and um, you're running an eight figure company. Maybe the series eight brings you to nine figures, but wow. Congratulations on this huge milestone, um, brother. Thank you and so much. I will be rooting on the south sidelines and um, looking forward to seeing your journey unfold. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, have a, have an awesome day. We'll keep in touch. Um, any last words for the audience as we close this up? Just keep grinding. Um, it is always, always better. And it's always feel, I don't, I don't even know how to describe the feeling when you win. Uh, but <laughs> what it takes to win can be very difficult, but never give up. There you go. There you have it, guys. Well, until next time, hope you guys enjoyed this brand new episode of Founders Unscripted here with your host, TK and my guest, Olamidi, uh, from Nigeria. Um, thank you, Tiki. All right, thank you. Thank you.